Okay, it's good to see a, a large number of you turn out. It was nice, good to see a full lecture room. In fact, I've, we've got my wife and Mike Zimmerman's wife as well joining us. So we've got to be on our best behaviour. So our first speaker is Dr. Olga Estapieva. Olga did her Masters in Aeronautical Engineering and then did a PhD with Professor Amy Morgans, our professor here in Mechanical Engineering, on fluid flow over vehicles. Is that right? Yep. And Olga is the, um, a senior consultant with Amy Strategic Consulting. She's their leading authority on the intelligent infrastructure smart motorways and the sort of connected world that we, we live in now. And I think that's going to be the topic of your talk. Is that right, Olga? To an extent, to yes. To an extent, all right, okay. Well, are you all, are you all set? You've got your screen up there? Yeah, you can start. So I've been told by the ICT man, I need to take a picture of you. So I'm going to do that. <laughs> and then we can start the process. Thank you for the introduction. Um, so, as you now know, I did my PhD here in mechanical engineering. So, I am going to talk about my path and how my career developed from mechanical engineering into data science field. And um, it was quite an interesting transition, but it wasn't a, I didn't find it to be a difficult transition because coming out from Imperial with an education in mechanical engineering, you will have most of the fundamental tools to do the job. And then it's, you know, just taking it from there. So to begin with, I'll talk a little bit about what I did and then I'll explain how I could apply all of the stuff I've learned now at the place I work at, which is Amy Strategic Consultant. So, my PhD was all about fluid mechanics, and it was great. I really enjoyed it. I essentially was um, looking at simulating a flow around vehicles with a square back. And I guess the main problem there that you've got is you have really high pressure at the front, and you've got really low pressure at the back, which generates a lot of drag. Being able to reduce the low pressure area at the back means you can achieve quite significant fuel savings. So that all sounds great, except that the flow at the back is also very, very complex. And uh, most of the conventional tools, while they could give you an understanding of what was happening, it wasn't giving you a three-dimensional picture of what was going on. So as you probably know, in fluid dynamics and computational fluid dynamics, doing simulations can get quite expensive if you try to include even as much detail as there is on this picture. So instead we use the simplified case, which is called the Ahmed body, this, and it still mimicked all of the main features of the flow. So the key premise of my PhD was to recreate this flow using larger simulations and then try to control it to reduce the drag. But there's a lot of interesting stuff also happening at the back. And um, for me, one of the most interesting things was looking at this phenomenon called bimodality. And essentially, it's a switching of the wake. As the vehicle moves, the wake will randomly switch from one direction to another one. And the way to measure it is to look at the difference of the pressure on the two sides of the back. So this is the base. And, um, after, I think, computing around seven terabytes worth of data, we could get our very meaningful result. And it was quite exciting. It was quite a big moment for me where we could see this. And essentially, what you're seeing there is this difference in the pressure and how it switches. And then these two toroidal structures, they correspond to the position of the wake depending on where this this was great. So it was very satisfactory to go through all this data, use all of this 
amazing analytical tools. Something like this that was easy to interpret and easy to use. So when I finished my PhD, I was like, that was great, but what's next? And um, because I really liked playing and doing simulations, looking at the data, I thought data science was a good way to proceed. Data science is a really large field, and there is a lot of applications. Fundamentally, I really enjoy it. So when I started doing research into potential careers, I learned about this thing called Industry 4.0. So what's that? Essentially, UK has some of the most amazing infrastructure in the world. The UK also pioneered a lot of the infrastructure, which means some of it is quite old. And um, to maintain it and to make sure that it's functioning and it delivers what it should to the public of the UK, there's a bunch of stuff you can do, very clever things, such as apply machine learning methods to see what's going to happen and how to improve operations and maintenance, use big data, so a lot of infrastructure in the UK will have sensors, and the amount of information coming in is vast, so how do you make sure that it's usable? Industrial Internet of Things, so it's those sensors that can directly talk to the cloud and then to a tablet or a computer. And digital twins, so rep representing these big infrastructure things digitally and being able to do some scenario modeling. So I was like, I definitely want to get into this. And um, that's how I found Amy Strategic Consulting, which is where I work now. It's, um, we're a team of about 130 people with uh, very different backgrounds. We've got quite a few PhDs. Um, we've got a lot of uh, masters, students, undergrad students. We're quite a young team. And um, we do a lot of exciting stuff. So I'm going to talk a specific project, which I really enjoyed during the last year of working there. And it's applying all of these concepts, such as Internet of Things, to a large waste processing plant. So we have a platform which we have developed. And I've been involved in the development of this platform, basically the full stack of it, as well as the analytics. And this platform takes in information from the sensors, and then it displays it in real time, but also allows to do some pretty advanced analytics. So this is what it looks like. This is the map of the trash processing plant. Um, a bunch of machines have sensors on them, so you can then go by location, and you get real-time readings. In this case, our team actually installed and developed the sensors which went on those machines, and they could mention, and I apologize it's in Spanish because the plant is in Spain, but <laughs> it measures the current, the temperature, and the vibration. Information coming in in the real time, so people at the plant can look at it and see if anything's going wrong. So just to give you an idea of what kind of machines we're monitoring, like these are big machines, they're pretty impressive. We've got the shredders that open the bags, We've got uh, ballistic separators, which will sort the trash according to weight, size, and density. And we also monitor trommels, which are basically sieves to sort trash by size. Um, the whole process is automated, and the line operates usually for about 18 hours a day. It's, when you visit the plant, it's pretty impressive. These are big machines, like the whole building is shaking. So. Um, when we installed the sensors, we were quite interested to see what we could observe. And actually, just by being able to get the data in, we could analyze both long and short-term trends. For example, looking at just two days' worth, worth of data. So this is for one of the motors on um, the ballistic separators. It's possible to see that when the machine starts, there is a higher current and the higher vibration because the motor is cold, so it's at its most vulnerable. And then as it warms up, which is the yellow line, it's possible to see that the vibration and the currents settle. So just by having this insight, we could have a chat to the people at the plant and say, perhaps it's a good idea not to overload machines, the trash early on the day, 
give it about 20 minutes to warm up, and then proceed, which was um, quite a quick win for us. And it was quite exciting to just see it and be able to see this picture from just a few measurements. There's also longer term things that can happen. So this is vibration data over a few months. And I mean, something's clearly not going quite right there. <laughs> you can see the upward trend. And uh, as we found out later, it was because a major component was failing in the machine. We spotted it at around here, so beginning of January. The staff at the plant could go and inspect the machine, understand what was happening, and then by monitoring it for another month, they knew that they could safely operate the machine and schedule when they will replace, the, replace this part, which was here. So they replaced the part, and immediately they can see that the maintenance took effect, the vibration went back to normal level, and um, again, they can see it straight away from the data available on this platform. So this is not very complicated stuff at this point, but having access to this data, you can also do some pretty clever stuff. Um, and this is where vibration analysis comes in. We programmed the sensors to take in little packets of readings at different frequencies and sample sizes. And then we analyzed those readings using spectral analysis. And um, again, coming in in real time, we could see those spectrograms. So this is a slightly complicated picture, so I'll talk through it a little bit. The x-axis is time, and then the y-axis is the frequency with zero being at the top. And essentially it shows um, how the frequency changes over time. And uh, we, this is a relatively recent thing, but we do have a data for a few months now. So we were able to figure out what's the normal frequency for these machines. And um, by figuring out the normal, we can then see if something's funky going on on a weekly basis. So this is, for example, one week worth of data. And we can see that at a higher frequencies, something's happening. So visually, that would signal that something's potentially wrong, except that these are really high frequencies. And in industrial settings, you don't get a clean spectral peak. So we've computed a what we think is a normal of those spectrograms, and using and basically used it as a cluster to calculate what is the probability that this type of behavior is an anomaly, which is essentially of the spectrums we're receiving from the mean. And actually, it's quite low. It's only about 15% chance that something's going wrong. And this is where, by connecting pretty fundamental engineering stuff with data science techniques allows a very quick analysis of what's happening. And um, I thought that quite exciting. So this was a good example, I think, where as a mechanical engineering, you, you could bring quite a lot of experience and knowledge to these problems. Because the real value when you're working with data is being able to interpret it. There's a lot of tools they have to learn for data science, and it's important not to focus on them too much because given the amount of innovation happening right now, most of those tools have a shelf life of about six months to a year, and then there is the next best thing. But um, if you are interested in a data science career and um, you would want to learn a little bit more about it, catch me after this lecture, or also, feel free to drop me an email. I'll gladly to speak to anyone. Um, if you have any questions either about Amy Strategic Consulting or how you could transfer into a new field. Thank you. Thank you very much.